So last session, we stopped here with Albert, which are some minor modifications to BERT. One of them was this factorized embedding parameterization. And the other one was cross-layer parameter sharing. And because of that, you could end up with smaller models. And as soon as you make a move towards smaller models, you can, uh, because your model is now more efficient, you can enlarge it and try to attack the state of the art. And then there was this other modification about uh, next sentence prediction and replacing it with sentence order prediction, which is a harder task to solve for. And later on, we are actually going to remove both of them. So they are not that much uh, necessary. And the other contribution was dropping the dropout. Because here you have plenty of data and maybe dropout is not necessary. Okay, if there are no questions about last session, we can move on to Roberta. Uh, what does it stand for? It stands for robustly optimized BERT. It's a robustly optimized BERT approach. So we are going to try to optimize BERT. And it's basically a replication study of BERT. So the BERT paper is written by uh, people at Google. This one is a replication study of BERT. And it's being written by, or it's written by people from Facebook. And we are going to try to see what are the pros and cons of BERT and try to replace the cons and make some improvements. Let's recap BERT a little bit. You had a segment, which is a sequence of tokens. It's going to be segment one. Then you had another segment, which was a sequence of tokens. And then what you would do is you would concatenate them. You put a classification token in the beginning of the sentence. You put segment one. Then you're going to put a separator token. Then you're going to put segment two and end of sentence token. So these are specialized tokens. And that's going to give you a single input sequence. And you usually control the sizes of your segments so that you, they are not going to become bigger than a maximum sequence length. Because we know that we are going to end up using transformers. And transformers, their cost is uh, quadratic in the size of the sequence. Therefore, you want to control that. And you pick a maximum. Maybe 512 is the maximum sequence length that you're going to process. Anything bigger than that, you truncate. Anything smaller than that, you're going to pat. And so far, so good. You're going to have a bunch of layers, transformer layers. You're going to have L of them. Then you're going to have a self, the number of self-attention heads that you're going to work with. These are hyperparameters of the model. You're going to choose a hidden dimension. And then the dimensionality of your feedforward layer is going to be four times bigger than H. That's the inverted bottleneck structure in transformers. Then BERT, when it came to writing down a loss function, was using mask language modeling, which was you would select 15% of your input tokens at random. You could go ahead and replace all of them with a the mask token, but then your model is going to be biased throughout the training procedure towards this mask token. And this mask, no such a token exists when you are doing your downstream tasks. If you are doing question answering, if you are doing classification, you are not going to be masking your sentences when it comes to testing, when it comes to your downstream task. But throughout the training, if what you are doing only is replacing your token or your tokens, 15% of them, with a mask, you are biasing your model towards this uh, uh, specialized mask token. To somehow mitigate that, we are going to see other ways of doing it in the future. But to somehow mitigate that problem, you are going to say that of the selected tokens that you randomly selected out of those 15% tokens, you are going to replace 80% of them. So it's going to be 80% out of those 15% that you already selected. You're going to do the masking on them. The ones, the 10% uh, are going to be left unchanged. And the rest of them, the rest of the 10% out of these 15% tokens that are candidate for masking, you're going to replace them with a randomly selected vocabulary token, with just a randomly selected word or subword. So is the masking clear? 
and why you would actually decide to do so. Okay, perfect. And then there is this next, next sentence prediction. You had positive examples, so it's a binary classification task. And your question is, uh, are these two sentences consecutive sentences from the text corpus or no? Are they pairs of statements from different documents? And we saw an intuition of why you would go with next sentence prediction. It made sense because some of the downstream tasks that we are going to work with later on are going to take as input two sentences like what you would do in natural language inference. And then you would start optimizing the parameters of your transformer encoder transformer or transformer encoder for uh, a lot of epochs. And those epochs are going to get uh, chunked into mini batches. And per each mini batch, you're going to update your parameters. You're going to take one step of your stochastic gradient descent. You can control the updates. You can say how many updates I want to do, how many weight updates, or you can say how many epochs I want to run. And they're going to end up being equivalent. You can compute one out of the other, knowing the total size of your data and the millibyte size. And as I mentioned, you're going to choose your maximum sequence length to be 512, and your millibyte size is 256, that you can divide it per multiple GPUs, and each GPU is perhaps going to process 32 uh, sentences or, sen or sequences in parallel. And then they are going to communicate their gradients. And in terms of data, you are using, or Bert was using, English Wikipedia and book corpus. And that's going to give you 16 gigs of uncompressed text. So we discussed everything now. To train any machine learning framework, you need to know what are these four components. First of all, what is your data? This is your data. What is your model? The model is going to be the encoder part of a transformer. Your objective function, which is your loss function, is this mask language modeling in addition to next sentence prediction. And then you're going to do your training. And later on, you're going to do fine tuning on a downstream task. And the, specific, the specifics of the training was, for instance, you're going to update for these many iterations. We know everything about BERT. What is Roberta then? You try to replicate those results and then try to improve those results. And at the same time, uh, remove their redundancies. If there are any redundant components from your model loss function optimization procedure, you want to remove them. Uh, I'm saying these modifications are simple. They are simple on a slide that I'm writing here. But actually, when you sit behind a computer, these are large scale problems. And each one of these modifications that you're going to make, you're going to train from scratch or pre train from scratch on a large data, and you're training a very large model. So you're going to do that multiple times. So it's simple on a piece of paper, it's really complex behind the computer. What are those changes? You're going to train the model longer. It means that you have to wait uh, for a very long time for your model to converge. And depending on how many GPUs you're using and what is your batch size, you might end up waiting uh, longer or shorter. But train your model longer with a bigger batch size and over more data. So you're going to increase your data set. The second one is you're going to remove the next sentence prediction objective. Now that you have a bigger batch, you have your training for longer, you come to the conclusion that this was actually not necessary. Its existence or uh, absence is not going to change much when it comes to your the performance on your downstream tasks. What else? Train on longer sequences. Now that you removed the next sentence prediction objective, rather than the concatenation of two sentences, uh, being less than a threshold, 512, only one of these sequences could be as big as that 512. So it means that you're training on longer sentences. One thing that you do in BERT, and I forgot to mention, is you have your corpus, in this case, books, book corpus and English Wikipedia. You do your pre-processing on your data, you tokenize it, and once you tokenize, you do the masking, and then those are going to be the inputs to your 
to your transformer architecture. So you were, you were doing your masking once and for all. It was a static type of masking. And your masking was part of your pre-processing step on your data. But this is cheap. Uh, masking 15% of your tokens at random, replacing them. It's going to be very cheap. Why don't you do it dynamically? And if you do it dynamically, the same sentence, if you see it in the next uh, epoch, it's going to count as another sentence because it's going to get masked differently. And that's going to act as data augmentation. Okay, so dynamically changing the masking pattern. And I mentioned you're going to train on more data. That's going to be a new data set, CC News. They collect it. Okay, perfect. Any questions so far? Okay, cool. What is going to be the size of the uncompressed text as a result of these new data sets? It's going to be orders of magnitude bigger or one order of magnitude bigger. What are the components? 16 gigs of that is what Bert was using. CC News is 70. Six gigs, open web text is 38, and the other one is 31. Now let's see these effects. Let's do ablation studies. This is BERT. This is a re-implementation of BERT. You keep everything the same, including masking only once and then using it, and the dynamic masking. So dynamic masking is actually useful on downstream tasks. Let's study next sentence prediction loss. You have two types of choices here. These sequences that you choose could be sentences or could be segments from your sentences, could be crops of your sentences. And Bert chose to go with segments because it was giving them better results. But if you go with sentences, which is what Roberta is doing, and get rid of the next sentence prediction loss, you're going to see the same level of performance. And slightly better. So NSP loss wasn't really necessary. This was one of those bells and whistles that you can just get rid of it. And then uh, you can compare the performance of BERT base to XLNet. XLNet we are going to cover either today or next session. So far so good. Then you can study the effect of batch size. What is the best batch size for pre-training? And it turns out that 2000 is giving you the best. You can also study your learning rate, and these are all of the details that uh, really matter when you're behind a computer. And imagine doing this over a data set this large and over models that are really big. And then you're, tr you're trying this out multiple times, changing your learning rate from one to the other one to come up with the best one. And the way that you come up with the best one is actually you're going to look at the performance of your model after pre-training, after fine-tuning, on these downstream tasks, on, uh, on classification type of tasks. Now let's study the effect of additional data. Additional data helps. Pre-training for longer helps a little bit more. And then pre-train for even longer, which is you're increasing these steps, uh, helps even more. And then you can compare it to BERT large and XLNet large. XLNet we are going to cover later on. Then you can... Uh, study or compare to the state of the art on Stanford question answering. So these are different tasks. And this is another question answering task. Any questions about Roberta? And the tokenization that Roberta uses is the token tokenization from GPT-2, which is byte level byte pair encoding. You're gonna use Unicode characters as your bytes. So you can uh, take a look at this code. The code is very clean. Uh, go to FAIR-SIC, FAIR stands for Facebook AI Research, uh, SIC for sequence. It's a library for doing sequence modeling. Sequence modeling could be, these days, anything is sequence modeling, even image processing or speech or even text. And that's a good library. And then take a look at how you would actually implement such a model. How would you do your byte pair encoding? and the corpus of your own choosing and basically explore. Any questions? Okay, cool.